All right, guys, welcome to today's episode of Comeback Conversations with my man, Rich. I'm going to call you Radical Rich from now on instead of Skeptical Rich. Um, we're just going to jump into it a little bit. So I want to thank you guys that are tuning in on iTunes or, or wherever the hell you're listening to this thing, if it's on Facebook Live or we chopped it up and did something with it. Uh, the first thing I'm going to address right now is there's a lot of guys out there that like to talk shit about my hair. It's cold out. I had to wear a hat, so it is what it is, right? Second of all, um, I want to thank you, Rich, for getting Uh, spending some time with us on this Tuesday. You, you've got an extraordinary journey that I'm excited to kind of fit into these 30 minutes. We could probably go a lot longer, um, but we're going to spend about the next 30 minutes kind of diving in, taking no real course of action except for letting this conversation go where it wants to go. So uh, the, the first thing that we're going to address, all right, I'm just going to have you come out of the gate, tell these guys a little bit about who you are, where you're from, what you do, shit like that. But ultimately, I want you to, I want you to address the skepticism, just like kill that stuff out of the bag. Because hands down, I think you're probably the most skeptical dude that I've that I'd ever come across inside of this program. And now you are part of this program. So yeah, go ahead and that's introduce pretty, yourself. Uh, that's Rich Speck, guys. How you doing? Uh, grew up on Long Island, spent my entire life here, except for four years in Florida. Um, made a lot of good friends in Florida, but uh, was not the place for me. It was a place to pursue aviation. And that's what I did for four years. But uh, I got out, came, I came home. They, I graduated on a Saturday. I came home on Sunday. And, uh, you know, just never, never pursued it much from there. I uh, just kind of floundered around for about eight months, found a nice, comfortable bar at my, uh, my guys from college, my, my high school buddies that didn't go away to school or came home. We were so proud of ourselves that, you know, 21 years old, we had found our old man's bars, you know, and I look back, it's pretty, it's pretty freaking scary how comfortable we got so quickly. And, uh, Talk about that for a second. So like it was, it was your spot. You guys were there. You're. 20, 21, 22 year old kids, whatever. And, and you were proud of the fact that you found a place to hang your hat for the rest of your life. Like that was it. That was the, that was the, the benchmark. That was the milestone. That was it. That was where your bar. bar. It was set. It was set high. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think back and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty scary to think that, you know, that was, that was cool. Right. We were there. What, yeah. What was the calling? Like, like I just, so, so I, I was a, a bar drinker. I mean, I drank all day. You, you kind of know the story, but I never had this one place that I wanted to go because inside of my mind, I had this like internal drive thinking that someone is out there or something exciting going on. I was missing it. Right. That, that's who I was. But what the fuck made you want to stay at one place over and over? And it's like, like cheers or whatever that show is. It, it's what was there. I mean, it kind of, it was the brotherhood, my friend, we're all my friends and you know, we could get together there every night and hang out, throw back a bunch of drinks and, and wander home. Uh, we got the bar to sponsor our hockey team and it was just, it was fun. You know, I don't, I don't know what made it so attractive, but it was, you know, it was solid nine months and should, we were the only people in the play. We were probably the reason the bar closed is because people would come into that bar and they saw these, you know, seven or eight knuckleheads so freaking comfortable. And, you know, we were the only ones there. And, uh, JD Marley's in Hicksville, long clothes. It's a laundromat now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you moved on since then. Yeah. Um, not that I want to rehash a bunch about it, but, but obviously you, you, you brought to light that you were drinking from a very, very young age, right? You went and did your thing, came back. Not, not really, really young, but 18, 19, 20 years old. That was kind of who you were. And then uh, how old are you right now? Uh, 49. You're 49 and, and you've got, I don't know, almost a half a year or so, I don't know how long you're, you're been in control Six, of your alcohol. June 2nd, seven months. So about seven months, right? So yeah, coming up much summer. drank from 20 to 49 years, almost. 30 years of your life, right? Yeah, big part of it. You know, mostly weekends, but uh, you know, everything was an opportunity to get together and have fun. And there was always alcohol around. Never really thought much about it. You know, even when we started having kids, you know, my wife and I, it was still kind of, was no big deal. You know, and it was probably only the last seven years that, you know, it ramped up. And that was when I had my youngest son, Owen. You know, we were, this was going to be like the sober kid. And, it, it didn't turn out that way. And, uh, yeah. But it did. It did. It did. It did. And it did not help. You know, I always, always had my career and I was able to manage that. Still am. Um, but I could, you know, I could see the relationship with my wife, you know, kind of going down. And again, didn't really think much about it. Just kind of went about its way. My, my father was a drinker. My mother was a drinker. Just, you know, beer, nothing crazy. But it was just always in my life. And, you know, I ended up where I was without Status a way quo. out. Status Stat quo. 
the, like the call we did yesterday, status quo, being stuck right where you're at, asking yourself, how the hell did I get here? Understanding you want out, but going, now what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Waking so, up. That's oh, probably what yeah. brought you here to the comeback, right? Yeah. You know, I, I think I told you, I saw your video once. You know, I'm sure a lot of guys in the group, there's probably still people following you, you know, for years and never clicking that. I was in the room I'm in now on the bed on the other side. And I had started meditating and started to read. I knew I wanted, I knew we needed something to happen. I just didn't know what that something was going to be. Uh, I saw your video one night, you know, I clicked on the link and booked my call. And you know, two or three days later, you and I were on a call. Some, some, some guy telling me he was in the middle of America with a phone number from Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So that was uh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that probably really added to your skepticism, which is the first thing that I want to, I just want to address that right now from a, from a marketing movement, whatever standpoint, yeah. like you, you know, on the side, like we're legit as fuck. I mean, it just, it is what it is. We say we're going to do something. We do it. We're either for you're either for us or we're for you or we're not. Right. And that's yeah. kind of the, the mentality that I lead these guys with and ultimately that you do now as well. Um, but the skepticism, so even though you committed to it, like I remember after you were, you were still going through the program, still wondering if it was legit or if I was legit or whatever it was, checking stuff out on my backstory and, and things like that, right? Um, yeah. How'd you break that? Because there's guys out there that think that way, right? Like, like there's a whole world of guys that need my help, but the skepticism, which is ultimately an excuse for them to not quit, right? Which we know, but it, like I would just, if you could help get one guy, uh, just to, to cross that bridge, this conversation would be fucking amazing, right? This conversation would be, would, would be great. Like it'd be worth something. So how'd you, how'd you fix that? Like, what was it? Ultimately it was in the results, Mark, you know, it, it, you know, you could, this is going to sound dickish, but you could, you could disappear tomorrow and my life is better for the last seven months. Right. So there's something in the message and I just stuck with it. I, I saw it right away. I just, you know, when, when I got the book, when I was watching the video, joining in on the calls, I was very quiet at the beginning. You know, I, I didn't talk until, I don't know, probably my fourth week. I wasn't one of those guys where you say, hey, you know, first time on and you're, you, uh, I was in the background. I right. wasn't sure what to make of everything. And in fact, my first time I spoke was on a Friday. You weren't on the call. It was Dan. Dan was running the show. And I'm like, all right, I got something to say. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it took a, it took a little, it, it, it took a little bit of time, but, um, I just saw the results and, you know, seeing the guys on Facebook, um, it was, you know, a guy like Alex Blair, you know, like, first of all, I was going to wear a sign today that said not a paid actor. I didn't know how you, was gonna, you were going to take that. But, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> but that was, yeah, that was one of the first things that this can't be real. Yeah. You know, this can't, this, this, you know, but time as the weeks went on, um, I just, I knew it was right. I could see my wife starting to look at me. Um, I wanted to introduce her to the program. My wife has always been, you know, whatever. She's, she's got trust in me and you know, she saw it working. And ultimately, you know, that's where we are now. Much, uh, much better place than we were six months ago. Um, I've, I've shared the story and I probably if she ever sees this video, she'll be pissed for me sharing it. But I was in the program two weeks. It was Father's Day. And she told me flat out, if it wasn't for a vow, she'd have been gone. And uh, that was a punch to the gut. And that was a week after I had my last beer. Um, and uh, yeah, that sucked. It sucked to hear, but I needed to hear it. Because it was the reality that I was ignoring. It was week after week. It was kind of the same thing. Like going to that Marley's over and over again. Right. Getting the same result. Telling yourself you're going to have a sober, this is going to be the sober child only to find yourself seven years later, whatever you said, and, and yeah. doing the same thing. It's about time your wife punched you in the fucking gut and all, all honesty, right. It was about time that she did that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I heard it and, uh, it resonated and here I am. Let's talk um, about a couple of different things like results and dreams and they're, they're going to be connected a little bit, but we're going to start with some of the results and then we're going to talk about the dream and what you're doing now and in, in life now. But, um, the, the biggest result, in my opinion, is not that you got control of the drinking, that you put that out. It's that your relationship is stronger, that you're a better dad, and ultimately your fitness, your fitness, your commitment to that and the commitment to yourself is amazing, right? Yep. Like, I, I, I don't like to put so much weight on the fact that, like, we just, I get it. The comeback council, when you come to it, 
I'm a comeback. We help you get control of your drinking first and foremost, right? But the results that are spawned out of that, because in my world and your world now, drinking wasn't the problem. It was the solution to what was going on or was that habit that you built. Now you've came back and your wife actually likes you again. At least I believe, right? Maybe a little <laughs> bit more. Um, you know, you're, you're doing great with your kids, right? Yeah. Better than you were before. And uh, you've lost how many pounds? I had, I had, my goal was to go to 175. That was what I weighed in 1996 when I got in the insurance business. So that was just always kind of like this back of my mind goal that I was going to hit. So when I started on the program and I, and I said, all right, week one was just trying to figure this out. I didn't want it. And then week two was, oh, got a guy in the group who's, you know, got a fitness, you know, program going. Let me see what that's all about. And everything just kind of dovetailed. Um, from there. So my, but my target was hitting 175, which I did. Um, and you know, now I'm, I still go to the gym five days a week. Um, uh, and I'm probably, if I weigh myself now, 182, I knew I would not, I was not going to stay at 175. I was going to put on you know some muscle and go back to eating some carbs. And, but what uh, were you? I was about 220 and I had no idea. I refused to get on the scale. Um, and I look at pictures and I put some on, on, on the page and I just didn't realize how fa fat, fat my face had gotten. And, you know, you see yourself in the mirror every day, but you don't see it happening. Right. And now when I, when I bring those up and I go through my phone and I go, holy crap, you know, it was just bloat. And I didn't eat like crap, but I drank a lot of beer on the weekends. Right. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> We had a guy in the group yesterday asked, said he lost like nine pounds or something like that and hadn't drinking in nine days or something like that, but he was consuming about 2,500 calories um, per day in drinking, right? But well, if you remove those calories, that's like 22,500 calories. I mean, that's, and he's like, oh, I hope I don't have tapeworm. Uh, but if he's watching yeah, this I saw that. now, but my point is like, the simple thing is, no, buddy, you removed a bunch of excess, non-needed carbs and calories and things, and your body's going, what the hell's going on here? You're losing some pounds, which is, which is a good thing. So, um, yeah, I, I was, I think you have some amazing uh, fitness results. I'm sure you have more that you want to do, but you don't even look like the same person. And as far as like, you know, your, your skin complexion, your skin color, uh, right? everything yeah. looks better. Much, well, thank you. Much, much different. You know, I had always... I was always a I, my always my excuse was always I'm a team sport guy I can't go to the gym, you know I gotta you know, I play hockey I play basketball softball and you know it's embarrassing to say I stopped playing hockey because I hated waking up on Sunday morning you know hungover as shit right to go play hockey so I, I pushed that just pushed a lot of crap to the side that I really enjoyed doing and never really realized that I would actually enjoy going to the gym um, but I'm there for a half hour I'm not I see guys there. You know, 35 inch biceps. That's I'm not there for that. I'm, I'm, I'm there to know that I got my heart going that I, you know, can fit into, you know, size 33 pants and, you know, be happy with myself. So I think that, that was comes, my, comes with age. <laughs> I think that, yeah. comes, you know what I'm saying? Like even where, I, where I'm making my transition, I'm, I'm 10 years younger than you right now, but even my going into the gym every morning right now is changing because I'm like, man, I don't really care how big I am or I don't need to bench press fucking 405 it doesn't doesn't matter what i need to do is just go in here and live a long time so i can make this movement help these guys and be a good dad and a good husband you know um but i want to talk a little more about like in your own words uh, mm -hmm. as, sim as simple as you can explain or define who you were to who you are now right like the difference inside of the world so so in your own words like this is the pit and the hell that i was in and this is what life is like right now. So I don't want to present these guys with the, the pain, essentially, right? A problem and show them what is possible by considering the opportunity just to believe in yourself. Because really, I showed you some cool shit. The program showed you some cool stuff, but you did the work, right? I just built something that resonated with you. Absolutely. Essentially, right? Cool. So I don't take, you know how I am. I don't like to take the credit for everything. I want you guys to be proud of, of what you're doing. So the pain that you were in, explain it. And then the possibility for these guys out there, or even some of these guys in the group are, are wanting to, to have what you have. Well, you know, I was meandering. I mean, that's, that's the only way I could put it. Every just going through the motions week after week, same thing. I wasn't a miserable guy, although, you know, it's funny. My daughter was home for the weekend and I told this, she's 19, she's in college. And my relationship has just gotten completely different with my kids because I'm not hiding behind that mask. I don't have anything to hide anymore. Um, 
at the time you don't realize you do. You just kind of, you know, you're just doing what you do. Um, so when I spoke to her and I told her about the program and she said, I used, this is, this was on Saturday night. She said, I used to be afraid to come home. From college. Well, we, yeah. In general, like when she was out with her friends because I was always so angry. I didn't feel like I was angry. Um, so, but I got every week, it was just kind of the same thing. You know, uh, I just didn't, you know, is what, I, what it, the scary part was, this is what it was with no plan to break it until I saw that video. Um, and then when I started to put the work in and realized that, you know, this, this is doable. And just to go back to the gym thing, to be something that's sustainable, you know, that lifestyle that I had was not sustainable. What I'm doing now is sustainable. And I can shift it up a little bit, but you know, it's something, I've always been a person that saw it, you know, some kind of even keel. And, you know, you'll be able to go to the gym a couple times a week um, and just and just be happy. Um, and then, you know, the biggest change. You had no gym experience, essentially? No, before this? high school. Yeah, just in high school and gym, go to college, just, you know, nothing. I, I didn't enjoy it. I, I, you know what it was? It, it was that it was work with no, no real payoff. I do like the payoff. So maybe that was, you know, part of the drinking too. It was the payoff, you know? have a couple beers and I'm, I'm in a zone. And, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and to get up and do it again, you know, on the weekends. Yeah. So I kind of lost track there. Um, so let's talk for the next 10 minutes or so about dreams, right? You started this conversation off saying that you were in Florida for four years and uh, to pursue aviation. Yep. Right? Now I know the story and have been watching the story, but you basically put your dreams on hold for alcohol with, with flying, right? So just share with these guys a little bit about the choice that you made to essentially fuck yourself up on the weekends over becoming a pilot. Yeah. So I, when I graduated, I came home again, wasn't sure what I do. Found that bar with my buddies. Um, was going to pursue a flight instructor job here because that's really the only way to get to get hours. You're either you know you have a connection or you got to teach people how to fly. So I have my flight instructor flight instructor certificate. That's how I was going to build hours. I should have stayed in Florida, but I came home. Um, jerked around for a couple months, went up for a check ride, uh, the only check ride I ever failed in my life. Got down on the ground, and the guy who I flew with, this guy named Henry Letterer, never forget him, old guy. We land. He says, I've flown with guys from your school. They turn out better pilots and that come back when you get your shit together. I said, this cranky old man doesn't know shit, blah, blah, blah. And this was the day before cell phones, but I knew I could go to the bar early afternoon and a buddy was going to be there. So rather than buckle down and hit the books and come back at it swinging, I didn't get in the cockpit of a plane for two years. Right from that day, from never years. took another two years, never took a swing at it, took a rental flight the day after TWA flight 800 blew up, just had this urge. I had to get up in the air and then I just let it go. And, you know, life took over from there, but I never pursued it beyond that. But it was always in the back of my head and everybody, oh, that was rich. He went to, went to school to be a pilot. Not nah, rich. There's guys that went to school to be a pilot. Rich went to school. <laughs> right. And, uh, so yeah, I put it on hold for a long time, Mark. It was, you know, something that I always wanted to do, but I, you couldn't, you can't go away for the weekend and fly home with a major hangover. Uh, you know, it's not a fun story to tell, but it's, it's a very important. It's your story, though. That's it the, is. So, so yeah. you have to tell it. Um, you just got back in last week, two weeks. Uh, last week, yeah, last week I went up in a gyroplane, not a traditional fixed wing plane that I had always flown. Yeah, I was looking at that was, thing. I was like, "What the hell is this? It looks like a bicycle or like a golf cart on wings or something." It it's got a propeller like a plane in the back with a up top um, rotor blade that looks makes it look like a helicopter, but just completely different flight characteristics from you know from a helicopter, and it was wild, maneuverable, and and wild. So that that's kind of my aviation dream has always been to have land and a property where I can land a plane on 
and go there. And uh, that's kind of my long-term dream is to be able to pull that off. In Long Island? No, no, no. We got to get out of here. Is there even land there? I don't know. I've never really been out there. You got to come. No, it's, it is beautiful places, but no, you can't. It is, the the real estate is too expensive. I got to go upstate New York. Okay. No, no. Um, But yeah, so that's kind of a dream that I have and I will, I will realize that at some point. Yeah. What other dreams do you think that you uh, you gave up on? Is there anything else? What other, maybe not dreams, what other things inside of your life do you think you missed out on by, by all those weekends to hanging out at the bar first? Uh, I, yeah, I, was a very, I was a very active in my church as a kid. Um, very active. It was a place I was there. If I wasn't in my house or at a sporting event, I was, I was at the church. And, you know, who wants to go over, go to church on Sunday morning, you know, hung over. Um, so I put that on hold uh, just because it was a lot easier to sleep in. Um, yeah, no, I was very, I, I taught Sunday school. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't know if I could go back and do that, but that's not a dream. That I have. <laughs> that's not a dream anymore. Talk about your new dreams. Let's get the fuck out of the past. Talk about your, your new dreams, man. What, what does the future look like for Rich? Well, you know, I love, I just got to say right off the bat, I love working with the guys as an ambassador. Um, it's something that I feel like I've studied for my whole life. Um, you know, I have knowledge and wisdom about how I got here and how I got through. So to be able to, you know, interact with these guys on a daily basis and, you know, do my best to help them through but more importantly, guide them to the program because that's where the work is. I mean, I'm there. I'll take the, I'll take the phone call. I'll take the text. But you know, the magic happens in the, you know, the interaction with all the guys. Um, you know, that's where the power is. But I love working with them. I could see me doing this, uh, you know, as, as part of what, of what I do um, because I get, I get more fulfillment from that than Good. The, th- the thing that uh, you know, keeps the roof over the head. So I just got to you know, keep a balance, but it is great. I see a guy like Al Perry. Um, I could name all the guys, but just, just Al, I love Al. He, for the first time I got on the phone with him, sitting in a rainy parking lot in the Walgreens and just hearing him and just in his voice, I, there was no wavering. This guy was going to. He's done a great the job. Most out. Unbelievable. And, and, and I, I got new, I got tons of guys, but Al just jumps to the top of the list. Um, and uh, I appreciate his, his effort that uh, got him where he is because he did it all. What do, you, what do you think your biggest takeaway from the comeback has been, though, for, for you? Like, so we, we live off the core, the core values of seven Fs, right? Faith, finances, family, fitness, future, freedom, foundation. Um, I believe in, in every season of life, as you know, I don't believe in an even balance. You might, I don't, right? I believe to get to the next level, so you don't drift and get stuck and get status quo. Some are always going to be a little bit offside. So right now in the past to build this thing to what it is right now, I've been heavy in the finance app, right? Work, 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 call, build video, failure after failure after failure, you know, like that, that drove me. Now I'm making a shift in 2020 more into my, for the first half uh, of fitness. Right. So I'm going to really put some more time on myself because as I've been building this thing, I, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in good shape and I take care of myself, but I'm not where I want to be, but I had to give up something to get it all. But then I realized this morning, I'm like, you know what? I really believe if I sit back and I look at all this, I can have it all by getting a more simplistic approach, which what I'm working on on 2020. But for me, what I'm saying is like, the, there, there's always something that I took away uh, from, from each one. Um, the, the finances one was huge because it built this fucking movement. What has been your, what's your favorite one? Like, what, what do you like? Family? And don't get me wrong, yeah. I love my family. No, no. But. yeah, I, it is. It is. It, it is. The fact that, you know, I don't have to, no, I no longer have to, you know, my, I, I got to really, I love my parents. Um, and uh, My dad is 88 years old and he lives in a hospital bed in their living room. And this, you know, don't kill me for telling this story online, but, but it's the reality. And my mother is 13 years younger and she's in a wheelchair. Ultimately, that's my future, right? If I don't make a change, that's my future. And my grandkids don't see my parents. Yet my mom's parents, or I mean, I'm sorry, my wife's parents are here on a weekly basis 
roughly the same age, but they're you know they, they take care of themselves. Um, so the family aspect of this that I can have that conversation with my daughter last week that I can spend four hours in the car with my son coming back from a hockey tournament and, and speak with him, you know, not as I just want to get home because I feel like crap because we were at the bar too long last night. Right. But to actually, you know, share you know, the things I've learned, you know, you know the, some of the principles that we have, he's only 16, but it's not too early for him to learn that you can, map out your future. Now, your future is a map for you. And you might think it, especially at 16, I'll just do it, I'll find it. You know, He wants to play college hockey. He's got to put the work in. So watching me sedate on the weekends was not probably not doing him any favors. Me sharing my struggle with him um, will do him favors. It's obviously, obviously up to him to, you know, right. take it to the next step. But, you know, it's a, it's a much better situation. So my family life, I would say, um, has been the biggest change for me. Good. So we're coming up here about five minutes left. What I want you to do is, yeah. is give a give a piece of advice for um, somebody. Else. So this is going to be more of the outside. Actually, you know, it doesn't really matter because some of the guys inside yeah. of the program right now are brand new day one. They might be watching this as we're speaking because it is live inside of that group. Um, but for guys that catch it on the replay down the road, like, Clicking that link was probably one of the best decisions that you ever made inside of your, your life. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it, it really was. No question. So, but coming up to that, to trust social media, to trust Facebook, to trust some guy, because there is people that get rip people off every freaking day out there. Right. Just, it is what it is. Um, but, but even if those guys that are not skeptical or, or just they're at that spot where they're looking for, relief because that's probably what you wanted at the time right like you wanted to be understood you didn't want you, you didn't want to be alone you wanted some comfort you wanted that shit to go away right yep. talk to that guy right now T tell him what he should do you got to trust in yourself and it's hard when you're in that when you're in that position and, and all you know is is what you've done for the last you know doesn't matter how many years um, you you have to trust yourself that if you put in the work and if you're honest with yourself if you stop blanking lying um, that you can, you can change. You can change. It's not easy. It's probably, you know what, honestly, it's, it's easier than I thought it would be because I, it is because I, it is once you identify what's important that it becomes, that becomes such crap that not that, that three o'clock text on a Friday afternoon to your drinking buddies or your, your brother-in-laws or whatever about, Hey, you know, where are we, where are we going tonight? Or, you know, whose house? No, it's what are we doing tonight at home? And so you got to trust you got, but you got to trust in yourself. It's, it's not about drinking. It really, it's not, it, it ultimately it's, it's about control. Um, you know, I told you when I came in, I wanted to figure out how to drink like a normal guy. And almost seven months later, I haven't had a drink right? because it's crap. You know, we're, as a society where you know, we're, we're loaded with, ads every day about I saw that, this is that Coors Light shower beer ad like that's out right now like encouraging you to drink in the shower that, that's let yeah, me ask that's you great, great great place to drink <laughs> exactly now I've done it before but let me ask oh, you yeah. This. oh yeah oh yeah um, and it was cool at the time <laughs> do you think or did you think because one of the things that I get a lot of flack from is if you read through the ads or anything that you watch is like um he was never a real alcoholic. He's an, like, like, I don't, I'm not looking to be called myself an alcoholic or label myself an alcoholic. Um, but I want you to go back to where you're at. Like, or you can't help, a, you can't help a real alcoholic, like real, real, like they almost take pride in, in that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I read them. Did you think like they, they take pride in saying how much they fucked up their life. Right. Which is why we don't help those guys. Not because I don't want to, but they don't necessarily want the help. They want their life. They, they want to, they're, they got a victim on their chest, the big V, and they want to go, and, and that's just who they are, and that's cool. I hope everything that they do works for them. But did you think you were an alcoholic or a hard drinker, or what would you have labeled yourself at before you came in the program? I think I probably would say, you know, alcoholic without really, you know, because that's what, you know, you're taught in school, and even, you know, back to high school, that this is what you do. And I remember the movies uh, that they would show us, and it was funny because I would see these movies in school, and then I go home and watch my parents. And it was just like my mom would smoke. 
I just watched a video about, you know, how bad smoking is for you, but the mom's smoking. So who's, who's the liar in this side? Who's full of crap? Right. Um, and then you, you kind of find yourself in those, in those circumstances later. But yeah, I would probably have said that. Um, but what are you saying? Now? That it is all about choice and, and what, you know, what do you want? No, no one ever. I've never done a funnel in my life. In all those years, I've never done a funnel. No one's ever poured a beer down my throat. Every drink that I ever had, I chose to pick up. I may have been in a, a woozy state and not making a good decision, but it was always a choice. And I chose that over these other things. And that's all it's about. And if there's one message, it's your decisions. And you have to, you can decide to, to drink. You can decide to drink. Never. You could try and fit it in the middle. For me, in the middle, I haven't even tried it because I don't want to. Because everything for me my, is better on the other side. I'm a different guy. I told you, I killed that guy. Rich, I want to end it right there because I think that, I think that was the most powerful, like, like that little clip that you just said and those things right, that you just spoke was fucking uh -huh. me. So I want to thank you brother, for taking the time out of your day to come and share some of your knowledge with me, uh, your story with me, um, and just to kind of get to know you a little bit more. I know I already know you pretty well, but get to know you a little bit more. It's good to talk to you and good to see you and, and just amazing to see the journey that you're on. So thank you very much, man. And thank you for being part of this comeback um, and, and helping me out spread the message. And I believe in you, brother. So have a great day, buddy. And uh, I appreciate it. We'll see you on our call in about an hour and a half. You got it. We'll see you there. Uh, Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Bye-bye.